Welcome to our community. Susie Thomas with you this morning. Very happy to welcome Jill Eileen Smith. She is an author who I love this title. She walked before us. Can't wait to get into this. Good morning, Jill. Good morning, Susie. Thanks for inviting me. So you write historical fiction, biblical historical fiction. Uh, Have you always been interested in kind of taking what's there in the Bible and thinking, hmm, what would it have been like to really be them and in their shoes and what else was going around at the same time around them? Is that how your mind thinks? It is now. It it wasn't (laughs) always that way. Um, I I came to Christ at like eight years old, but Mm. when I was around 16, I read my first biblical novel, Two from Galilee by Marjorie Holmes. Wow. It's, it's still my favorite Christmas story. But yeah. anyway, um, after I, I closed those pages, I was like, these people were real. It brought the Bible so to life to me to realize Mary and Joseph had real problems. And this was a real situation that Jesus was born into a real world. And it, it's not just a fairy tale or or. The Bible seems so, you know, hard to, not not hard to reach, but sometimes people think it's harder to understand than it is. Mm-hmm. And that, that book brought the people to life. So many years later, when I was um, co-teaching a Bible study in King David, I got to the end and went, I want to read a book about his life. Now, I'd already read a lot of biblical fiction, anything I could get my hands on, but Mm -hmm. I've never read one that satisfied me about him, especially after studying him. Yeah. I couldn't find it. I didn't know how to write. I mean, except for your basic letters or journal, you know, posts. I'd never taken any lessons on writing at that time. And I ended up writing the book I wanted to read because I couldn't find it, but I, I didn't know cool. what I was doing. So 20 years later. <laughs> <laughs> well, you must have been pretty good at it. Oh, my goodness. I mean, that um, that really, first of all, it's quite an epiphany for a teenager mm-hmm. to think, oh, these were real people. These two mm-hmm. people had quite a, pr- this was a situation. This woman, before she's actually got a ring on the finger, is pregnant. That's a problem mm-hmm. in any culture, in any civilization. <laughs> That's a situation. And to be able to really look at them as human beings and not just the very stoic posing of a live nativity scene that we're used to, <laughs> yeah, that, that really, really is something for a, a what'd you say, sixteen for a sixteen-year-old to yeah. have that insight. It's amazing. Well, I, I've read all my life, and I guess I just I had older siblings, so you kind of just grow up faster, maybe. I don't know, mm-hmm. but it just I've always cared. I think God just gave me a heart to care about him at a very yeah. young age, and so maybe that's why it, it was easier to grasp. But um, And to think that, you know, he knew them. <laughs> he yeah, the absolutely. He was there. He knew them as well as he knows us. And <laughs> yeah. how many hairs were on their head as well. Exactly. And exactly. It, it is really, a, it, it's a different way of looking at all of this. Well, you must have been good enough because that was 20 years ago, and you're still at it and doing really well. <laughs> it took 20 years to break in to learn to write very well because I, I really taught myself and took classes that were through a- ACFW and other places. Mm-hmm. I, I read a lot of how-to books and had critique partners, and, and but it, it was a struggle. I wrote eight books before the first books on David were the ones that sold, mm. Um but I had written suspense and women's fiction and other stuff. And I think all of it was just God's way of saying, I need you to learn how to write everything. And whether I publish it or not someday is up to him. Mm-hmm. And I, I don't I don't have any concerns about that. I, if God wants to use something, fine. If he doesn't, that's okay, too. But um, it, it was a learning. And I can use all those different tools in biblical fiction. Sense can be there, women's fiction, kind of all the tools you use in any genre can fit in biblical fiction. So. Mm. Well, for She Walked Before Us, you're looking at some of the women in the Bible. Yes. Tell us who you get to know, who we will get to know as we read this. Well, remember, this is a nonfiction, but it has fictional elements. Mm-hmm. And all of the 12 women in this book, because I did one other nonfiction, were 
people that are in every of the novel, every novel I've written, they're either in it or they're the main character in it. So there's 12 of them. That it's Miriam and Rahab, Deborah, Ruth, Naomi, mm-hmm. Hannah and Peninnah, who were sister wives, Michal, Abigail, Ahinoamak, and Bathsheba, who were all wives of King David. Wow. But when I wrote Wives of King David, I only wrote about the book's titles are McCall, Abigail, and Bathsheba. The other two just show up because there's not as much on them to make yeah. a whole book. Yeah. Did you feel as you were writing this that you really got to know these women better? Um, I think so. I mean, yeah, actually I did. Because when I got to the Wives of David, I had studied his life for seven years. Yeah. I'd written a two-volume epic. Then I wrote Abigail for five years of homeschooling, just, you know, learning a different point of view. Then I wrote McCall. I was like, okay, these should be a piece of cake, right? I know these people. Mm. And I got to their stories, especially Abigail, I believe, suffered a lot of abuse. Might have been physical. Definitely, probably verbal. Have I experienced that with my husband never right so I I couldn't relate to that um then I got to a Hinoam who'd lost a son who'd committed who'd raped his his half-sister and like can I relate to that and there was no way and Mm -hmm. in the first book I tried to relate to the women this time it was like I can't relate to most of these women I have not lived their lives yeah and I, I didn't have enough personal experience to draw on, so I had to change how I showed it to the, the reader. And this is what we know about her from Scripture, and this is what we can learn and apply. And I tried to be, it's actually more positive than the first book, because the first book was written from a different place in my life, and this book, I had a lot more hope as I wrote it. And mm-hmm. so, but he, even though the Murder and adultery and rape and all that is in there, and abuse. It's horrible what these some of these women went through, and I can't relate to that. I can still learn from it. We can still learn from it. That's right. Did you learn more about King David through the eyes of the women who were married to him? I think so. I mean, I've had a I raised boys, so I've had the <laughs> me too. The, the, the sad, I not bad but my agent when she first met me she said you're a hard sell because now my male characters they were my my main characters and mm-hmm. they they didn't sell very well i had to learn to like girls and i have two granddaughters and i'm madly in love so <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah um not a problem but um king david yeah i always tried to understand why did you need more wives you know like he had mccall and he lost her he had a Hinoam probably on a rebound. He had Abigail, which, you know, he probably had an instant love for because of her beauty, and then her husband died. Mm-hmm. But after, you know, after that, it was like, why, even after getting a call back, why, why did people do what they did? And I tried to come to grips with that as I wrote their stories, and even in this book, um, I don't know. I think some people see him as this really uh, cunning warrior, and he was. Mm-hmm. But he was also a, a very uh, intelligent king. But he was also a man after God's own heart. Yes, and even and a sinner, and he was flawed. And you know, we all have strengths and weaknesses. And David yeah. certainly come out in scripture, and hopefully in my stories. So. What are we going to learn in She Walked Before Us? Well, I hope, as with every book, that this one, as I was glancing over it before you called, I hope three things are, are something we can take away from it. One is that it is absolutely essential to forgive. We, we need God's forgiveness, and we need to forgive others. And if we can't do that, we will be bitter, miserable people, mm. and it, it is a big deal to God. It is also a big deal to God to reconcile. That's why he sent his son, to reconcile the world to himself. And I think that there's issues 
in every home, every neighborhood, every friendship, every nation where there needs to be healing and reconciliation, but that takes humility and it takes the forgiveness. So they go together. Yeah. That's huge for me and it matters a lot for me. But then another thing that God teaches me is, do you trust me? Yeah. You know, can you be patient and have faith while I work, even though you can't see it? Yeah. Because we all have things we want, and we all have things we need, and we all have frustrations, but we want it now. We're, we're so, in, I'm so impatient. I know our whole society is, but I, I know I am. Oh, yeah, we're microwave and, uh, people. <laughs> for sure. <laughs> and and drive through. And drive through. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Uh, and so, yeah, I just think that um, we need to trust the Lord. If we are, mm-hmm. if we are taking it into our own hands, if we are complaining, as Miriam, my next book that's coming out next year, is, I'm just doing my last edits are on. Mm-hmm. She's in this book. Complaining is a big deal to God. It's, it's showing your ingratitude and your inability to trust that He can do what He said He'd do, and that's what I hope we learn. But he will do what he promised, and he does keep his word, and we, he wants us to just rest and trust that he will do it. And if we are walking with him and we're trusting in him, we can trust. I mean, trusting as in with our whole life, mm-hmm. you know, not just those people were real. He's real, and yes. he's, we need to experience him in a very real way to know that deep in our heart in order to trust them because without that if it's all just in your head you learned it in church or whatever you don't aren't going to have the same kind of trust as if you give it it becomes real to you like like the people of scripture why is this so important right now in our country in the current atmosphere of everything going on right now why is this book's message so crucial right now? Because we're a mess. <laughs> <laughs> I seriously. Good answer. Ah, <laughs> uh, my my cat was sticking his tongue out the other day, and I took a picture and I posted it. This is what he thinks of twenty twenty. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's a meme. That will go viral. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't make that's it a meme, but I should, right? Oh, my but, goodness, yes. Yeah, I mean, can we restart, please? Can so, we? You know, <laughs> you know, there's not one good, almost not one good thing that we can look back and think about, except we had a grandbaby born and got to meet her. Oh, actually. that's wonderful. So it's like, yeah, COVID's ruining our lives. I can't stand a lot of the things that have gone on because of it. Mm-hmm. Not, And it's not just COVID. It's isolation and what it's doing to mental health. Yeah. And... And people are having physical. I know of two people found dead in their homes. Oh, you know they my. they just would never leave their home. They were isolationists, oh. and the fear of COVID it's it's destroying people. You cannot live in fear. Fear is not of God. I don't. I know it's a tendency to be afraid. This is an unknown pandemic, and we don't know how to fix it. And we always get worried when we don't know how to fix it. But God said, "Love cat perfect love casts out fear." Yes. And fear, if you're fearing, you're not trusting, we can't let it destroy us or we'll be controlled by it and anyone who wants to control by fear. So yeah. those are things that we need, you know, every one of those women in this book lived through some sort of fear. I mean, the fear with during the slavery Miriam lived through, the fear of, of uh, the rape and torture that went on during Deborah's day, the fear of could she trust the Israelites that Rahab faced when they came to destroy Jericho? Every woman had some reason to fear. We all do. And every man does. And we can't. This society, I think, was let our fear turn to anger, turn to bitterness, turn to hatred. And I was reading scripture the other day where Jesus, Jesus on the Sermon on the Mount equates murder and hatred. And I thought about that. Uh, I mean, the verses came to my mind anyway, and mm-hmm. I was I was thinking, why did he equate hatred and murder? And I'm not just thinking that it's because it's as 
you can't you would murder someone because you hate right but when we really hate somebody we kill a part of ourselves mm. we we really do we we kill mercy we kill grace we kill forgiveness and that will eventually destroy us hatred will destroy the person who hates faster than they probably can imagine and it's it's awful and i think that's why it's equated with murder even more than having gone out and physically killed someone god forbid that ever happens because we need not be a people that that murders murders wrong on every level and i think you know what i mean by that yes yes <laughs> no matter <laughs> no matter where what where you fall on the spectrum of age yes you know god says choose life yeah, and, she's life. Yep, and even for you and me, and and you know, every day in this lockdown or or fear of going to the store, or don't to get too close to me, you know, choose life, choose to live the life God said. I want you to fulfill these works. I've created you for this purpose. Don't be afraid. I've got this, and just keep doing what I've given you to do. Mm-hmm. Do it. Do it in, in respect for the authorities, sure. Wear your mask if mm-hmm. that's your, what you're being told to do. You know, keep your distance. Yeah. So you don't make people afraid, but don't stop living. Yeah. That's what some people are doing, and yeah. that's what I hope this book helps people. Turn to God. We need to be grateful. We need to be re- in the Word. We need to be praying. If we're not people of prayer and we're Christians, we need to reevaluate. Mm. Mm-hmm. Why are we not people of prayer? I mean, God is my, I, I talked to, I don't know, this isn't to brag. It's not a pious thing. He's just been my friend since I was a child. I, I've always talked to him like I would yeah. a friend. Yeah. And I think that we all need to learn that honesty with him and talk to him. And, to live in that attitude of prayer. We're speaking well, we're speaking with Jill yeah. Eileen Smith, and she's the author of She Walked Before Us. Going to need to take a short break here. We'll be back after these words. You're listening to Our Community. Welcome back to Our Community. Susie Thomas visiting with Jill Eileen Smith, author of She Walked Before Us. Uh, you can get a number of Jill's books and the novel books based on historical biblical figures with a neat story written around them, or this one is a little more, as you said, nonfiction. Yes? Or you yes. said, yes. Um, and I always have to think, wait, nonfiction is the one that's true, and fiction is the one with the story made up. <laughs> so I always have to remember well, that. <laughs> yeah, so, nonfiction is your self-help books. Yes. Your, your commentaries and your they're not novels. They're not your entertainment, usually. You go to them for to learn. But each of the people that you write about in this, you have written a novel about, or most of them appear in some of your yes. novels? All of them appear in some of my not. And I mean, some are directly like Deborah has her own book, Ruth does, but Naomi's in Ruth's book. So, you know, not everyone has their own novel, but they're all in one of the novels. I just kind of think it's got to be such a fascinating process to do that kind of research to be able to come up with a story about somebody where you're adding to the scripture not not adding to the scripture in the way that we're told don't do that but writing a story about you know it might have looked like this and have you learned some things or had some kind of aha moments when you were getting that deep into someone's life and going into the scripture that deep and I'm sure there's additional research that you do as far as like going into the times and the culture and so forth so that you can write it so authentically. Any aha moments come up? Oh, all the time. (laughs) And you can share with us? Well, I think, I don't know if I can think of a specific one, but Uh I will say that probably almost every author, our our story, I'm sorry, character, I meant to say, Mm -hmm. in, in these books, um, they will be going through some hardship and I will be going through some hardship, but of course it's not the same thing. Mm -hmm. And my hardship, I remember one day I was struggling with something. Don't ask me what, because this is back 
back when I was writing Abigail, and I'm like, that was way too long ago to remember what the specific <laughs> was. But uh-huh. um, I pulled the car in the garage, and I was like, Abigail might have felt like this. Mm. And for a completely different reason. And I've noticed that I feel like I almost suffer in a certain way if the character is going through suffering, which is why I will never write jokes. Yeah, don't. You stay away from that one. <laughs> yeah, well, and I feel like Naomi was already a, a, a female Job. Yes. And thanks, yes. thankfully I didn't experience her losses, but yes. I feel like I've experienced something that will give me a similar feeling. Mm-hmm. And and it's always like, it's always so hard to get a first draft down, and it's hard to suffer through something and then realize that your emotion might be exactly what your character was feeling. And you're like, but can't I just be, you know, happy, joy, joy all the time while they're suffering and write it anyway? Yeah. <laughs> but I don't know. I feel like God allows to... you to go through yeah. some challenges so that you can write right. authentically. Maybe. I, it's, it's almost, I mean, dare I say that suffering in certain ways is a privilege because God said we, we should rejoice in all things. Wow. At least in them. And maybe he's allowing it for something great in our life. And it's a test, perhaps, as in Abraham's case and Job's case is a test. I don't want those tests. You know, nobody does. But there's so much that we don't know what he's got prepared for those who love him. Right. So I'm trying to ask him to, I'm trying to learn to release. Mm-hmm. Things I want to see change, see, things I want to happen into his hands because I'm not him. Yeah. And I, um, I, I don't know. I want. He's God read, and we're not. I know. And yeah. it, he says, have faith and patience. And yeah. I'm like, okay, will you please help me? Because I know we're not supposed to pray for patience, and that's a big joke among Christians. Uh, exactly. Think, yeah, that's the one. <laughs> right. But I think it's God's favorite word. Yes. and patience, yes. and I feel like he wants to give, he, he didn't doesn't ask us for something he won't help us with. Yes. So why not ask the Holy Spirit to help us with the patience and faith we need? Because he can give that, us the grace to have it when yeah. it seems impossible to wait one more second for the stupid iPhone to stop giving trouble or, you know, whatever right, it is we're right. facing. Yeah. Um, he can give us the grace to to wait and not get all upset about stuff. I have so far to go. <laughs> yeah. We but. we all see that that Christian who is so mature, hmm. and we think we all want to be that person, but none of us wants to go through what they've gone through to get there. You know, yeah. I mean, if we're voting, <laughs> I'd rather not. Thank you, but uh, yeah. we all want to be there. So, yes, God in his perfectness knows what we can handle when and gently takes us down that path to to keep us turning more and more like him. It's but it is a we're all works in progress. You're working on Miriam right now. Um, What's where are you on that one? And what are you finding out? What are you learning new about Miriam? Well, I'm actually on the final stages of Miriam. The page proofs are on my couch as we speak, and wow. I still have about half of it to get through by next weekend. Um, but it is, um, it's going good. I feel like Miriam, she was tough. She, there's, not, there's nothing on her in the scripture, hardly at all, except for her watching baby Moses in, yeah. in the ark. Yeah. And then later we're told she's a prophetess and a leader in Israel, and she sings a song. And there you have it. There's my whole book. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> you fill in the rest. You connect like, all those oh. dots. I'm like, why did I agree to this contract? <laughs> Honestly, I tell my husband that on every book. I tell him, this is going to be my absolute worst book ever. Because I, I can never get through a first draft without crowding about the difficulty of yeah. understanding it. But to understand these very minimal women of scripture, we have to understand the men around them because that's what we're given. So I studied Moses and Aaron more than I did her. Yes. And I also picked a husband from scripture and gave her an actual 
son that's in scripture that may not have been hers at all. We aren't even told if she's married. But in her culture, it would have been likely. So I took that chance that she probably was. Mm -hmm. And then um, I think the most exciting part of that book for me was the scriptural part where it never registered to me. But there was a time when Moses went up on the mountain and he took 70 elders, including the two oldest sons of Aaron. They all got to sit down at a meal with God. Wow. I mean, if you go back, I don't remember. It's easy to school. skim over that part. That is, it's in there, though. Wow. And I can't remember where. So it's the it's, it's wow. scene this in Deuteronomy. Yeah. But anyway. Yeah. And, I mean, they saw this beautiful, um, you know, the I forget if the lapis lazuli or the clear gold. I forget what was mm-hmm. how it was described mm-hmm. because I don't have the passage open. But, you know, they ate down, and it was either, you know, the angel of the Lord is the son of man God because you can't see God's spirit, but somehow they were able to sit down and have a meal with God. So after this meal, Moses gets called up on the mountain, and he told told the men to wait there. Well, I don't think he realized how long he'd be up there, and so they didn't stay. They right. came down, and that was when the, and I think, I don't remember if that was when the golden calf happened, but it could have been that it happened shortly after, or if that was another time. But what was significant to me was kind of like how, Solomon heard the voice of God at least two or three times, and yet look what he did in disobedience. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And in this case, Aaron's two oldest sons, Nadab and Abihu, who were high priests in Israel, sat down at a meal with God and then were killed by God for burnt or offering foreign incense on yeah. God's altar. Yeah. And you go, whoa! How could you disobey something so obvious when you? Oh, you were God. Just there, yeah. I just this blows my mind. But then I think, but look at yourself. You can't blame other people, even in but their cultures were very different. But even if they were just like us, when we look at other people and not at ourselves, you know, God's just still trying to make us like Jesus, and we're not there yet. <laughs> no, we're not there yet. We are works no. in progress. This Absolutely. is going to be an awesome read. It's called She Walked Before Us by Jill Eileen Smith. Cannot wait. First of all, it's got to be a big deal if you're a woman to even get mentioned in the Bible. Not a lot of female names. So to be able to go through all of these women And what we can learn from them is going to be a wonderful experience. So, Jill, thank you so much. Where do we get it? Amazon? Amazon and wherever you buy books, I'm guessing. Wherever you buy books. um, The links are all, should all be now updated on my website. If you go under the book section under nonfiction, just scroll to where all the links are. Perfect. Um, Baker Bookhouse was offering a, a sale for a while, but I'm not sure if that's still on, but you can go to Baker Bookhouse's website as well, or Baker Publishing Group as well. And we'll uh, check that out. And you, have yep. a, and you have a really good Facebook page, too. We can look for you there, right? Right. Awesome. Mm-hmm. She, walked be- Smith. she Walked Before Us, Jill Eileen Smith. Thank you so much for joining us today on our community. Thank you for having me, Susie. It's been great.